Hello, so this is my media clip final project for the assessment and special education course. So I have a short PowerPoint going over a lot of the content that we covered this semester. The first thing that we're going to look at is the least restrictive environment, also known as LRE. And the least restrictive environment is the extent to which a child with a disability is educated alongside children without a disability. So pretty much the LRE is how often a student with a disability is going to be in the general education classroom. Um, and the goal is to have those students with disabilities in the general education classroom, learning alongside those children without disabilities. Just like our picture shows, this first, um, the general education class, is the goal. Okay, and if we look at the rest of these, the second is inclusion. So this is going to be when there is a special ed teacher. A lot of times it's going to just be a para or something like that um, to support within the general education classroom. So that student with a disability is going to be in the general education classroom, but they're going to be receiving extra support. So they're still included. Um, and then the third one is the resource room. So students are pulled out of their regular classes to meet with the resource teacher. So they're not going to be in the general education in class any longer. They're going to be in the resource room. And a lot of times this is going to be um, very specific. So if a student struggles with math and not reading, they're going to be in the resource room for extra math support, not reading. So it's going to be what they need, and that's when they're going to be in the resource room if the inclusion wasn't working well for that child. Because like we said, the goal is to have them in the general education classroom, so they're going to try that as much as possible. Okay, and those are definitely the most um, common in the classrooms, but there are three other um, ones that we will go over. The fourth is self-contained, and this is when the students are taught by special education teachers with other special ed students only, or other students with disabilities. Um, and so this is going to be that those students are in the special education classroom pretty much all day, with other students with disabilities. So that's what that's going to look like. And then the fifth is separate schools. So the students with disabilities are going to attend schools specifically for students with disabilities. And then this last one is residential. And that is when the students permanently reside or live at their school for special needs. And the last part of the LRE is how the special services, how the delivery of the special education and things are affected by the LRE. So depending on where the student is getting their support or um, where their LRE is, their least restrictive environment, where they're learning at, the delivery of the special education services are going to be different. So, for example, if a student has, um, let's say they're at the two, the inclusion, then there's going to be a pair with them helping them out during the time needed. So, again, if they just needed a little extra support for math, there's going to be a pair beside them. Okay, but if that inclusion isn't working and they need even more support, then they're going to be going to the resource room to get that more individualized um, support on their math because they're really struggling with that and they need help. So the delivery is going to look different based on what their least restrictive environment is. Okay, so after understanding that, we will go on to the special education assessment process. Um, and over here on our picture, this shows the special education assessment process. So it starts with referral. And once we get to referral, then we evaluate the student. We look at their eligibility, create an IEP if needed, placement, kind of finding that LRE and what's needed for them, instruction, um, what instruction do they need, interventions, modifications, things like that, 
annual review and then as you can see it just keeps going and going and going so it is a cycle a lot of times it is um, talked about as being a cycle and why because it never ends so you're constantly working through the process to ensure the quality education to um, the student or for the student so you're going to be working on evaluating the student and their eligibility and their IEP and things like that. And it's not just going to end. You're not just going to evaluate them, deem them eligible, write their IEP, um, get through all these, and then be done. Because the student is constantly growing, they're constantly learning, and they're always changing. And so their needs, especially at school, and for helping them learn, are also going to be changing. So you constantly have to be going through these. Evaluate, is my teaching um, effective? Um, doing little assessments to see if they are still eligible, working towards those IEP goals, updating as needed, um, the annual reviews, things like that. So you're constantly working through um, this special education process because, again, it never ends. You're constantly going to be working through it to make sure that you are helping the student succeed. Okay, and then the assessment process, I'll go into that a little bit more in depth. And this is split into four phases. And each phase has important tasks or steps. And it is very important that you um, do each of the steps or the tasks in each phase as all of them are important and you don't want to skip any because you want to make sure you're getting the student the best quality help that you can. So the first um, two steps, the first step is identification and referral. So this is screening and teaching identification. So this is kind of just um, looking at, I kind of think this student might need some extra supports, do a little bit of screening, things like that, and then providing interventions and modifications, and then kind of looking and... Um, reviewing your own teaching and looking at if you have provided those extra supports and if those still aren't helping, things like that. Um, kind of looking at what you've tried. Um, and then the pre-referral strategies and then referral and parental notification. You'll notice that parental notification and um, agreement is going to be a common theme in the special education process because it is so important to have those families involved and the parents have to agree to everything because it is their um, student, their child. So that's going to be a common theme in most of these phases. So this phase is pretty much just looking at um, the child and um, just seeing what they need and if they need that extra support. And so phase two is determination of eligibility. And this is when you're going to design the individualized assessment plan. And this is just looking at the assessments that the student is going to take to further understand where they're at and their needs and if they do have some sort of disability. So Here's the parental permission. The parents have to agree to the assessments. So you're going to write out this plan. The parents are going to view it. They have to agree to it before anything is done. And then if they do agree, then you're going to administer, score, and interpret the assessment results. You're going to report the results. And then after looking at those, you're going to make decisions about the student's eligibility for special education services. And if they are deemed eligible, you move on to phase three. So right here, the program planning. This is where you're going to design the individualized education education program that or the IEP and this is a very very individualized um, education program there's no other there's no better way to say it um, for the student so what are you going to do for them to help them succeed in the classroom what do they need what are they going to work on things like that um, and then again after it's written the parents have to agree to it um, after agreement, we move on to step four, which is the program implementation and evaluation. So immediately after the parents agree to the IEP, it is implemented. It's not a, 
oh, we are going to do it next month or next semester. As soon as it's agreed to, is implemented and then there's ongoing progress monitoring just to see what's working well for the student where are they still struggling things like that then there's an annual review of the IEP to update as needed because again the students are growing they're changing their learning so it needs to be updated as well and then there's going to be curriculum based measurements and then periodic re-evaluation of eligibility and a lot of times that is every three years Okay, so that's a little bit about the special education process or cycle. Um, next, we're going to look at family participation. Like I said, a common theme was parental agreement because it is very important that the parents or the families are involved in their child's education. Up at the top, I have when parents and professionals work together, the student receives better services. So it's so important that the parents and professionals are on the same page and they're working together because when that happens, everyone's going to be providing those extra supports and helping the student and they're just going to receive the best help that is possible. So some strategies to encourage that family participation in the assessment process is first to just communicate with the family. Be open, be positive, be clear, send frequent um, just communications home with the family and make sure that it's not these long big education terms make sure it's something short positive clear um, just to let them know that their students doing well um, next is to make participation a possibility um, some parents are going to view you as um, the professional which I mean you are but they're going to think that you know it all and nothing that they say or think is going to matter or that they didn't have these opportunities when they were in school or whatever so they don't think that they need to participate or they don't think that their participation is necessary so it's very important to let them know like it is important that you participate here's why here's how so making it a possibility. And then the next two are building trust and being respectful, which um, is pretty much self-explanatory. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Um, get to know the family. Be respectful. Be kind. Um, kind of self-explanatory there. Um, and then next is to ask the family for help or suggestions. It's their student. They know best. Ask them for help or suggestions. If you're stuck with something for example, um, the student is struggling focusing. Hey, I've noticed that so-and-so is really struggling with their attention. Do you have any suggestions? And then just being committed to the student. If the parents can see that you are very committed to the student and their success, they're going to be way more likely to help you out, work with you, things like that. Okay, and then the last thing we're going to look at is the derived scores, and there's three main ones that we're going to look at. The first is percentile ranks, which indicate relative position within the norm group, and this is not a percentage. The next is standard scores, which is when you transform the raw score to a new scale that has a set mean and standard deviation, and this is used to compare performance. So for the standard score, Let's say the standard score was on 100, that's going to be right here, and if the student scored right here, and let's say it was a standard deviation of 15, then they're going to score 115, and as you can see, that is above, there's one standard deviation above the mean, and that's just looking at how their score compares to others. Um, which is the normal distribution, that's what this is right here. So this is kind of less students, more, a little bit more. This is the most frequent, and then back down. Um, and then this to nines is scaling points on a nine point scale, which represents a range of performance. So now comparing and contrasting these a little bit. So um, a comparison is that none of these are typical grade percentages. So it's not like they scored a 90%. None of them are like that. Um, but the scores do show how the students performed in relation to a norm group. All of them do that. Um, and then some differences is that this to nine, you're going to get a score um, one through nine. 
okay? It's not going to be like 50. It's going to be 1 through 9. Percentile rank is going to be a percentile from 1 to 99. And again, it's not going to be 97%. It's going to be 97th percentile because it's not a percent. And then last is the standard score, which varies, but it is normally between 85 and 115. So that's just a little bit about the class.